No? Yep, now it's on. Okay, uh, well, welcome tonight to our team of Christmas. Uh, we're glad to uh, be able to do this. Uh, uh, typically, we've done this in the uh, Tabernacle in the past, but they're not doing concerts uh, uh, this year, unfortunately. So uh, we're grateful that we are able to do the, this here tonight in, at Mount Mulvey Middle School. Uh, we're a small crowd, um, but uh, we're, we're very grateful to have those of you who are here, here. Talk a little bit more about the, the, the details about Two of Christmas a little bit later, but uh, uh, the, the main thing is that it's an opportunity for tuba and euphonium and baritone players to get together and, and uh, uh, play music that uh, um, is written just for these instruments and also something that sounds like a melody. Uh, a lot of times these instruments don't get that opportunity, and we'll talk more about uh, the, these instruments a little bit later as well. Uh, without further ado, we'll go on. Uh, the first two numbers that we did were Joy to the World and uh, God Rest and Merry Gentlemen. Uh, the next one we're going to play is Good King Wenceslas. Thank you. 
Okay, obviously, we, that said, we did uh, Good King Wenceslas, uh, the first Noel, the Wassail Song, or Wassail Song, depending on how you like to pronounce it, and Angels We Have Heard on High. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of uh, Two for Christmas now, just a little bit, to give you an idea of what this is all about. Uh, Two for Christmas uh, is run, it's, a, it's an international organization, and it's run through um, the descendants of Harvey Phillips. And Harvey Phillips is a very prominent tuba player. Um, he passed away just a handful of years ago. Um, most of the people that are, most professional tuba players who are around my age, give or take 10 years or so, um, at least had a master class under Harvey Phillips if they didn't study under him directly. And uh, Harvey Phillips, um, here, I'll, I'll read the little uh, history that the, our little book has here so you can get an idea. Harvey Phillips was inspired to create Two for Christmas as an annual event to honor his teacher, the late, great William J. Bell. And uh, uh, William J. Bell is probably the first um, virtuoso tuba player. And uh, he was born on Christmas Day in 1902. And uh, Harvey Phillips was one of his students. And uh, uh, pretty much all of the professional tuba players that were Harvey Phillips' age had studied under William Bell. Um, anyway, so uh, he did that to recognize William Bell's legacy of all artists, teachers of the tuba family of instruments. Uh, tuba Christmas performances feature traditional tuba music, especially arranged for the tuba Christmas. Um, the first Tuba Christmas was December 22nd, 1974 at the Rockefeller Center Ice Break in New York City. Um, most of the original tunes were written by a man named Alec Wilder. And uh, um, Alec Wilder, incidentally, passed away on Christmas Eve, 1980. So uh, uh, both William Bell and uh, um, Alec Wilder had uh, ties to Christmas, um, either by birth or by their passing. Um, so essentially what Harvey Phillips did was he wanted to have, like I said before, a, a, an event where two players could get together and play stuff written just for them. Um, uh, if any of you have played tuba or baritone or, or a euphonium in, in a band or whatever growing up, you probably remember a lot of what we call oompas. Uh, any tuba player here want to play an oompa for us? Please. And uh, a lot, yes, that was, that was great. Perfect. Um, a lot of tuba and baritone and euphonium parts sound just like that. And uh, so not a lot of melody involved there, right? But it's an important part for a lot of band music because uh, it's kind of what holds the band together. Uh, the, in fact, uh, um, my first band teacher used to call the tuba the backside of the band. Um, and uh, because the whole band essentially sits on the tuba sound, right? Um, so all these instruments are interrelated. I'll talk a little bit more about the details of that. But the other purpose of, of tuba Christmas is not just for tuba and euphonium players to get together, but tuba and euphonium players of all ages and all skill levels. And you can see that we have quite a variety of different uh, um, uh, players up here, uh, some of us who have a little bit of gray in us and things, and uh, others of us that most definitely do not have a little bit of gray. Um, and, and that's the purpose of it. We can all get together, younger players can play with more experienced players, and, and have the opportunity to, to, to really play some great music. All right, without further ado, uh, we're going to go move on to Silent Night.
Sign of Night, Carol of the Bells, 
deck the halls, and a very tuba arranged away in the manger, featuring the tubas, which I think is kind of neat, and the holly and the ivy. I'm going to come down on, uh, below the stage here so you can see the players here for this. I'm going to talk a little bit about the instruments. I have to kind of forewarn you if you haven't been to one of these before, right? Um, my background is in uh, musical instrument repair, and uh, I, uh, I got into musical instrument repair because I was interested in the instruments themselves, what makes them, what makes them work, and, and how they function, and, and so on. So I, I can get a little long-winded here. I try not to be uh, because of, I'm also the kind of guy that will sit around and, and read about the history of musical instruments for hours. So I, um, I'll try to condense what I know about these instruments down to something that that. Uh, uh, will be interesting. Hopefully that'll all succeed. Uh, first off, um, we have the baritone and euphonium family. Can everybody who's playing a baritone or a euphonium please hold your instrument up? Okay, and uh, um, these instruments, uh, roughly nine feet long if you were to straighten them out. And uh, um, that is the exact same length as the trombone, by the way. And, and, uh, there's a lot of crossover between the trombone and these as far as the uh, acoustics goes. Um, the, the trombone functions differently because it has a, a hand slide, right? Um, if you have a baritone, hold that up. That's a baritone too. There we go. Okay, so those two are baritones. Uh, if you've got a euphonium now, hold it up again there. And uh, those are the euphoniums. And, and uh, there's not a whole lot of difference between the instruments. The baritone and the euphonium, but there is some. Um, the uh, the instrument that we call the baritone or the euphonium today, they kind of evolved uh, from from instruments that were popularized kind of in the 19th century. Um, there were three instruments in the 19th century that uh, were all about nine feet long, um, and uh, one was called a tenor horn, one was called a baritone horn, and one was called a bass horn in E flat. Um, they all pretty much played the same range. Um, the biggest difference of those at the time was how big the bore is, so the inside of the instrument. Um, the uh, tenor horn would be the thinnest bore, and, uh, um, and then the baritone horn would be sort of in the middle, and the, the bass horn would be the fattest one. Uh, the instrument that we call the euphonium today is most like the instrument that in the 19th century they called a bass horn in E flat. Um, and that's because the bore size is, is closest to that instrument. Um, and also, um, the uh, euphonium is, is more conical shaped than the baritone is. Um, um, all of these instruments um, are somewhat conical shaped, and that means that if you were to straighten it out, it looks something like a cone. Um, the euphonium is much more conical shaped than the baritone. The baritone is slightly more cylindrical shaped and it has a smaller bore. And cylindrical, you know, just like a cylinder. Um, there, there are long sections of the baritone where there isn't much of a taper. It's not as much cone shaped. And, um, that gives it a little bit brighter, a little bit more piercing sound than, than the euphonium. Um, and uh, the trombone, by the way, is, is the most cylindrical shaped instrument out of the brass instruments that, that we hear today. And it, and that's why it's the most piercing and uh, brightest sounding of, of the brass instruments, even though it's the same range as, as these. Um, now, the tuba is twice as long as that. And if you've got a tuba, hold that up. And the tuba is, uh, okay, yeah, good. Um, the, the tubas that we have, they evolved also from instruments that were popularized in the 19th century. And, uh, um, they're based on what is typically called the double bass or the contra bass horn um, or the, the double B flat bass. And any of you got a C tuba? Okay, good, there, there's a C tuba. Um, the C tuba is slightly smaller. It's, it's a, it, um, some serious college and professional players, a lot of them will play on a, on a C tuba instead of the B flat, which is uh, the one that uh, students typically learn when they're, they're growing up. And uh, um, so it's not quite as, it's not quite twice as long as, as the euphonium and baritone, but uh, um, kind of plays, pretty, pretty much plays in the same range. And a 
lot of uh, modern C tubas will have like 20,000 valves on them, you know, to give them the same range as, as the, uh, the double B flat. Um, but anyway, it was, a, it was also considered a bass horn in the 19th century, but it was the bigger bass horn. Um, uh, let's see, we've got, how, yeah, we've got a rotary valve, and so you can hold it up. You can see there, um, they have these little paddles in the front that they press. And what that does is that that, um, that paddle is a lever. When you press it, it turns a little uh, valve inside there so that it uh, um, reallocates where the air goes, basically. It adds, adds that little extra tubing that way. Uh, if you've got a piston valve, it's just hold it up. And most of us here in this group have piston valves. Um, and uh, those, they work kind of the same, but instead of pressing a lever that turns a valve, they basically they just push the valve up and down. And, uh, and again, it opens up extra airways uh, to create extra tubing and things. Um, uh, this is the reason why these instruments evolved mostly from the instruments that were played in the 19th century, is because that's when um, the early 1800s, about 1817, is about when the valves were first invented. And so uh, most instruments that we see today uh, uh, evolve something from what was being played then. Um, this is a fairly homogenized group. Um, let's see, let's just really quickly, if you've got a, a bell that points up, hold it up. You can see uh, the majority of them here uh, have bells that point up. Um, if you've got a bell that points forward, or at least curves forward, hold that up. There we go. The, the two baritones are that way. In, in the United States, uh, typically, uh, uh, baritones point forward, but they don't have to. A lot of baritones point straight up, just like the euphonium. And there are also euphoniums that have bells that curve forward, but by tradition in the United States, that's typically what you see. The tube in the back with the bell forward, we, um, this was a popular instrument uh, for roughly 50 years or so in the 20th century, and then um, shortly after World War II, they kind of fell out of style. And, uh, um, unfortunately, because I really like them, it's, it's referred to as a recording bass. And the reason it's called a recording bass is that uh, um, in the very early days of music recording, um, microphone technology hadn't developed really well, and bass instruments didn't pick up real well. Low notes didn't, uh, didn't record so well. Uh, of course, nowadays we've got microphones that do all kinds of crazy things, but uh, in, in those days, uh, when you would record an orchestra, in, like in the, the wax cylinder days, in the early days of records and so on, if you recorded an orchestra, you'd, you'd all just be sitting there, there would be one microphone pointed at you, and uh, you'd play, and, and nobody would hear the bass. And so what they would do was they would take these tubas with a bell that curved forward, and they would stick it in front of the microphone, and uh, the tuba would play that bass part. So if you hear any really, really old recordings of orchestras, the bass part might actually be a tuba, not a not a, a double bass, just because you couldn't hear it. And uh, so, um, so as a result, we refer to those as the recording bass, or some people will call it a recording tuba. Um, they become, they're kind of a popular item at, at tuba Christmases and things. And, and this is a small group. Uh, a lot of the tuba Christmases around the country and in the world get much, much larger. This year, a lot of those really large groups canceled for obvious reasons. Um, the very largest one that was ever held uh, was just a couple of years ago in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, there were 708 players. And uh, um, in Logan, the first year that, that we did this in Logan, uh, we had, I think, six, six players or something like that. Um, and uh, since then, we've kind of averaged between 20 and 35 and, and so on. And, but again, that's kind of still a small group. Um, I attended one in St. Louis a number of years ago that had a little over 300 players. Um, in some of these bigger ones, you'll see um, some other instruments that we don't see here tonight. And I'll just kind of quickly you know, uh, mention some of those that you might see. Once in a while, you'll see people show up to these with an instrument that's called a serpent. And uh, um, it's just like the name sounds, it looks like a snake, it looks like a serpent. And uh, that's kind of a really old, version of these instruments. And it goes back into the Renaissance times, and it literally was a snake, and had some holes, and, and uh, you play it that way. Um, kind of like recorder's fingers, sort of, um, but uh, it was a brass instrument like these are. Um, and uh, sometimes uh, at some of these bigger events, people will show up with an instrument that's called an off -clide. An off looks like 
like a cross is between a, a, a euphonium or, and a uh, saxophone uh, because it has all kinds of keys um, but it, it's played with brass mouthpiece and uh, so sometimes you'll see those at some of these events. Quite, they, we don't have one this year. Usually we have at least one sousaphone and everybody knows what that is. In fact, that's the instrument that most of us think of as the tuba. Uh, that's the one that kind of wraps around and has a, a bell that curves forward. And it's called a sousaphone because it, um, it wasn't really invented by John Philip Sousa, but he designed the instrument that became the sousaphone. It's based on an earlier version of instruments just like these. Uh, they were just like them, except that they would wrap around. Uh, instruments that wrap around the body actually have been around since basically the Greek Empire. Um, and the, the Romans especially used an instrument called the cornu that, that, that would wrap around like that. Um, in the, the 19th century, we had an instrument called the helicon. And you'd see those in all kinds of big sizes and, and things. And Sousa um, had a number of the tuba players that preferred to play the helicon because it was kind of easier to hold and stuff, especially if you had to stand up because it would just you know, hang on the shoulder. And uh, he didn't like the helicon because the belt kind of points off in a really weird, odd side direction. And, uh, and so what he did, he wanted a, a, a concert instrument that could wrap around. So he, created, he designed and, and worked with some manufacturers, and they created one where the bell pointed straight up, and it would wrap around like that. Well, nobody these days plays on one of those. Uh, they went out of style really quick because they became more popular later on in marching bands, and so they turned the bell forward so that you could use it in a marching band. And, and so typically you'll see something like that. We don't have them this year, but most of the time we have at least one or two. And uh, let's see, my oh yeah, occasionally we have a player that will come up from Bountiful that plays on what's called a double bell euphonium. Um, if any of you have seen the musical The Music Man and heard the song 76 Trombones, you know that in one spot they talk about double bell euphoniums and big bassoons. Right? Well, the double bell euphonium looks just like one of these euphoniums up here, except that it also has a second bell, a little smaller bell that cur usually curves forward. Uh, the bell is referred to as the trombone bell or the trombonium. And what that does is that if you press a particular valve, uh, the sound will come out of the little tiny bell, the trombonium, instead of the euphonium bell. And uh, this is a more piercing trombone-like sound rather than a, the, the more mellow euphonium-like sound. Um, anyway, Jerry he comes up from Bountiful once in a while when he gets the opportunity, and uh, he um, this year, this year, obviously, but sometimes you'll see that and show off that little tiny bell. Uh, those were really popular in the U.S. for a long time. The reason for that was that uh, um, in the early 20th century, most of the professional musicians came from Europe, primarily from Italy. And uh, Italian players would show up with this instrument that was called, they called it a euphonium or something like that, and it had two bells. And so um, that was the cool thing. If you were uh, somebody that played one of the nine-foot B-flat horns, um, you know, you, what you wanted to play on was one of those because all of the cool, really good um, professional players were these Italian guys who played on these things. Uh, eventually, uh, Con, an American manufacturer, started manufacturing them. And that's actually where we started using the name Euphonium was from about that time period. Con actually made two versions of the instrument, one with two bells, that they called the euphonium, and one with one bell that they called a baritone. Um, and that was slightly before we started making the baritone a little bit smaller and more, slightly less conical, a little bit more cylindrical. Um, and over time, though, when you get into World War II, and this, World War II is when the uh, recording bass went out of style, or just after World War II. Same thing with the double bell euphonium, they started going out of style at the same time. And, and, uh, uh, the reason for that with the double bell euphonium was that it was just, it just cost so much more to have that extra tuning and that extra bell, and so um, people just finally decided that it just wasn't worth the extra money, because um, it was really kind of a novelty thing anyhow. It looks like something from a Dr. Seuss book or whatever, and so the only time you typically see those now is at a tuna Christmas. Okay, let's see. I didn't think we're going to go on here, um, but first, before I do that, 
Um, I didn't have it mentioned yet. Our conductor is Karen Teacher, um, my wife, and uh, um, uh, yeah, we're lucky to have her because she's, she's a really good conductor, a really good musician. Um, typically, though, this time of year, she's, she teaches choir at Grand Canyon High School. Uh, most of the time, this time of year, she's so busy that she doesn't have time to think about uh, doing extra things for us and things. Um, obviously, because of uh, COVID-19 and all of that, a lot of her schedule is more clear than it normally would be at this time of year. So I'd like to thank her for, for being our conductor this year. And uh, without further ado, we're going to go on and we're going to play O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Before we go on, I do want to mention a few uh, thing, people that we want, we need to thank here for, for making this happen. And of course, the biggest one is the Harvey Phillips Foundation that uh, organizes this and, and uh, um, uh, makes sure that it happens, provides the music, and, um, and uh, uh, you know, gives us the, the opportunity. Um, if you uh, have the opportunity to look at your little Every year, it's kind of a tradition to have a little pin, um, and it's different every year for each year. Um, you can see some of the players who have hats and things on, or, or jackets or whatever, with a whole bunch of different pins on it. Um, it's kind of common for these players to, to play, uh, to collect them over the years and have all kinds of different ones. This year, appropriately, the, the picture is of the world and a face mask around it but done so that it looks like Christmas. Uh, so we, we thank the Harvey Phillips Foundation and Mr. Harvey Phillips, uh, uh, rest in peace, uh, um, for making this possible for us. Uh, also, thank you for uh, Mount Logan Middle School for allowing us to rent this building and, and uh, um, so that we have a, a space. And, uh, this is actually a really pretty nice stage to be on for a middle school. It's kind of an unusually large one. Most of the, the newer middle schools have a smaller stage and, I think the acoustics are not too bad here. Um, and you know, 
know, I went to school here when it was a junior high, and I, I don't think I appreciated, you know, what a, what a nice uh, uh, stage this is. So, anyway, so thank them. Thank Karen Tuescher for, for agreeing to come do this. Um, she's not being paid to do this, so, um, you know, appreciate that. And of course, all of the players, uh, they're not also not being paid to do this. In fact, they had to pay to do this, because um, you know, there's a registration and so on. Um, and speaking of that, um, one of the stipulations uh, with this concert is that we're not supposed to charge for it. However, typically we also don't rent a hall, and uh, we did charge tickets and things, but if, uh, if you have a couple of extra dollars, you would, you would be willing to donate in order to, to, uh, to offset the cost of the fact that we, that we rented this. Usually the, the tabernacle allows us to play for free, of course. Um, we'd really appreciate that. Um, there are you know, costs involved in, in, in making this happen. So if, uh, if you have a few extra dollars and you want to donate, uh, uh, please feel free to do that. And along with that, we, we do have to the Christmas merchandise over here. And after the concert, uh, if you have any interest, we've got scarves, hats. Some of the people are wearing those to the Christmas hats there um, and various different things. There's a tote that you can buy and, and also a CD of Harvey Phillips Quartet. And they call themselves the Cuba Shop Quartet, playing some of these tunes. A bunch of four professional players playing really, really nice versions of these tunes that we're playing. Um, the next tune that we're going to play is Fum Fum Fum, or Foom Foom Foom, depending on how you like to pronounce it. Um, my son, who's gone for a couple of years, you insist on me telling this joke, or he tells it when he's here. Um, the first two Christmas that I ever went to was, was in Provo, and uh, that, that was typically uh, organized and run by Steve Call, who uh, is a Utah State graduate, but uh, became a professor at, at a school down there. And uh, um, anyway, uh, he's kind of the tuba guru of the state, uh, one of the finest musicians I think I've ever personally met, um, especially on tuba. Anyway, he used to tell this joke every time I would go down to, to one of his events. So one of the ways you pronounce this is thumb, thumb, thumb. So we're going to have thumb, thumb, thumb until our daddy takes the tuba away.
recognize some of the, the players here and uh, for um, various different things. And so I'm going to come down and, uh, and also we're going to need the audience's help for some of this. First off, we're going to talk about the youngest player in this group. If you are under 70 years old, stand up. 70, 70. Yeah, okay. But that, I believe that includes everybody, myself included there. If you are under 60, stay standing. If you are under 50, stay standing. Mm -hmm. If you are under 40, under 30, under 20, under 18, under 16, under 15. There we go. Here is our youngest player. Okay, and then over here. 
Okay, let's see. I think it's a tie between these two. Let's, uh, we're gonna have to have a runoff here. So these two, let's go back over here with this one. All right. Okay, all right, we've got our winner here. The hat always does it. It's hard to beat the hat. Okay, thank you. Now we're gonna go with the best decorated instrument. So if you have a decorated instrument you would like to be considered, please stand. And come on, here we go. Any others? All right, well, okay, how about this one? Yeah. And this one. It was close, but I think that one had just slightly more. There we go. Now, the final one, well, almost, but there's one more after this. The overall effect. So outfit and instrument. So this is this is the grand prize here. If you want to be included with both outfit and instrument, please stand. Come on, you've got both an outfit and an instrument there. Stand. Here we go. No one else wants to be considered? Okay, well, by default. There we go. And uh, the last prize is for our conductor for Thank you. 
well, the crew in space. So that, of course, was Jingle Bells with the National Emblem March thrown in the middle of it. Um, and uh, it's kind of a fun one to play. And we will then finish up for real this time by playing We Wish You a Tuba Christmas. <laughs> 